Forty years before the infamous witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts, Hugh Parsons stepped out of his dirty, disease-ridden prison cell in Boston and was carted off towards the courthouse in order to stand trial as a witch. He'd come from a small settlement named Springfield, over a hundred miles away, and spent the last year cooped up in a concrete prison with his life in the balance. The previous few years had seen the fear of witches spread like a disease throughout New England, with cases springing up like boils on a plague victim. Accused, tried and sent to prison to await a verdict, Parsons had survived the cold winter drinking filthy water and eating gruel in an overcrowded jail. And finally, he was to find out if he was to be lanced. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark History Season 7, Episode 5. I'm Ben, your host, and this week we have a corker of an episode. Again, it's one that's slightly longer, so we're probably going to launch more or less straight into it. So yeah, let's get on with it. This is Hugh and Mary Parsons and the Springfield Witch Trials. The 1600s were a difficult time for many groups in England. Conflict was rife as the economy struggled to get to grips with a population that had nearly doubled in less than a century. Meanwhile, the religious gentry had seen the Protestant Reformation backslide into an uncomfortable place as King Charles I aligned the church in ways that began to reinstate the modes and mediums of worship that the reformists had fought to eradicate. The king was at odds with many of the political front too, culminating in the 1629 dissolution of a parliament that fell in odds with many of his governing policies in order to enforce his views that as the king he should reign over the country with the royal prerogative that was preordained to him under a mandate from God. This enraged many who were politically opposed to the monarchy but also a considerable number of religious Puritans and reformists who considered the king and the Church of England to be too sympathetic to traditional Catholic practices and supportive of the courts who were busy prosecuting separatist gentry for their opposing religious views. Dismayed with the entire situation, many sought to look for a new life in the colonies, where they could escape to a land with a blank slate and an economic, political and religious environment more in line with their own sympathies. Whilst the economic risk of migration was relatively high, the lure of a fresh market and religious freedom was strong for many, and in the 17th century alone, more than 350,000 Britons sailed across the Atlantic to try their luck in the New World. Few would live to call it a resounding success. Many would wind up dead from war or disease, and even more would return to England decades later, worse off than before they had left. The vast majority, however, would scrape out a meagre existence, living a difficult life on the edge of poverty and civilization, learning the hard way that religious, political and economic freedom came with its own set of restrictions. Of those that left England aboard a fleet of ships to the New World shortly after the dissolution of Parliament, were the thousand or so Puritans that would populate the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a vast stretch of land chartered to a group of merchants, gentry and craftsmen that reached out from the eastern coast all the way to the Connecticut River. 200 acres of land were carved up and passed out for those that were willing to invest into the company's stock from the outset, while smaller parcels of 50 acres were promised to those that paid for their own passage or the passage of others. The fleet became known as the Winthrop Fleet, named after the governor of the new colony, John Winthrop, an English lawyer, Puritan and lord of the manor who had a deeply religious view for the colony's future. Also aboard the fleet was William Pynchon, a wealthy English churchwarden and merchant from Springfield in Essex, who had decided to journey to the New World after his landowning family had fallen on hard times. He had invested £25 in the colony upon the realisation that church reform would be unlikely given the current situation with the king. The fleet of 12 ships sailed from Southampton between March and April of 1630, arriving in June to a grimy, failing port town known then as Salem. Salem was not the most welcome site after two months at sea, as the disease-ridden port was in poor shape, full of starvation and struggling to expand past a muddy strip lined with a handful of dilapidated shacks. Moving up the coast, Pynchon set off quickly and eventually settled himself just south of a settlement that would later become Boston, where he lived through a troubled year after his wife died of scurvy, leaving him to care for their four children alone. 
Mrs Pynchon's death was just another example of how dangerous it was for the settlers. A third of the fleet's passengers had not even managed to survive the ocean crossing, and of those that did, she was one of the almost 200 that perished in the first year of the fleet touching down in Salem. Conditions in that first year were so bad that of those that did survive the first winter, 100 returned to England and the remainder struggled to find even the most basic food. Despite all of this, there were some who pushed on with their mission, including Pynchon, who remarried two years later and moved the whole family to a new settlement that he helped to found named Roxton, where he worked as a treasurer for the Massachusetts Bay Colony and began trading in linens and beaver furs. He was granted a special privilege to trade with the Native Americans in the area, and slowly he began amassing a great deal of wealth. He founded a church in the fledgling village that had seen general conditions slowly improving as more and more people arrived aboard ships from England. Whilst this influx was good for trade in one respect, it introduced overcrowding and new competition, and Pynchon soon found himself moving on once more, hoping to trap the beaver skin trade further west into the Connecticut River Valley, where he also hoped of finding an area that may be more amenable to farming than the rocky grounds around Boston. Pynchon found his ideal site deep in the valley, situated alongside the major river trade routes to the west and surrounded by woods and marshlands to the east. By 1936, he had pitched up a stake in the land, known locally as Agawam, and had started the preparation of a plantation in earnest, after he had been permitted to develop the land as he pleased by the government back in Boston. Pynchon divided the land into plots along three pathways springing from the main street, as well as allotting ten acres of planting land to each household on the other side of the river. Whilst he was dividing up the area, he set a hard cap of 50 homes, though at first he could only feel seven. One of the first points of call for the plantation's founders was to erect a church and install a minister at the earliest opportunity. We intend, by God's grace, as soon as we can, with all convenient speed, to procure some godly and faithful minister with whom we purpose to join in church covenant, to walk in all the ways of Christ. Quickly, Pynchon purchased more of the land from the natives, who had that year been devastated by a smallpox epidemic. He also purchased the rights to plant and hunt in the area, starting what would become a somewhat stable but forever precarious business relationship for decades to come. The natives were permitted to continue to hunt, forage and plant on the land themselves and were paid 18 coats, hatchets, hoes and knives for the privilege. For a moment, the settlers were able to sit back and revel in their colonial paradise, isolated far from civilization, where they would be free to worship as they pleased and trade as much as they were physically able. Homes were built, as was a warehouse and a long meeting hall opposite the alehouse in the centre of town, and despite huge hardships over the first few years, the settlement did eventually grow through hunger, heavy snowfalls and never-ending disease. At its worst point, the population dwindled to only a handful of settlers, but by the end of the 1630s, it had sprung back and even begun to expand, and at the head, as treasurer, magistrate, founder and governor, William Pynchon watched over it all. The settlers built small timber-framed houses, farmed wheat, barley, maize and flax, they fished in the Connecticut River that ran parallel with the main street and raised cattle and pigs. The birth rate remained low, as did the survival rate of any children that were born, but the community strived together, securing the knowledge that their fears and troubles would be yesterday's news, providing they were able to remain on God's true path, and eventually the colony, now renamed by Pynchon after his hometown of Springfield, had more than doubled in size as more and more people found themselves attracted to the furthest flung settlements, far away from Boston, where they were free to make their own futures, or at least die trying. Mary Lewis arrived in Springfield in 1640. Born in Wales in 1610, she had ventured to the New World, following a depressing start to her adult life. She had married a man named David Lewis, but things had not gone quite to plan, and their relationship had ended in ambiguity after he disappeared ten years later. Their relationship had never really been on particularly solid ground, after Mary had refused to convert to Catholicism on her husband's request. Following his disappearance in 1637, Mary spent a period searching for him and joined an independent Calvinist church in the southeast village of Wales, just over the river from Bristol. 
The preacher of the church was dynamic and charismatic, and he spoke passionately about the possibilities for a new life in America, which led Mary eventually to boarding a ship following in the footsteps of many of her fellow parishioners and sailing to Salem in 1640. It wasn't an entirely reckless adventure on Mary's part, and she used her religious connections to secure a job once she arrived in America, managing to lock down the position of housemaid in the home of William Pynchon. Within weeks of her arrival, she had been transferred to Springfield, where she worked in the service of Pynchon's daughter, Anne Smith, who was heavily pregnant, along with her husband Henry. Before long, she had relaxed into daily life at the modest settlement, which by 1641 now had around 45 residents, many of whom had come from backgrounds familiar to Mary, and there were several of her neighbours that had originally hailed from Wales in the West Country in England. The savagely cold winters and the disease-ridden wet summers soon became the new normal, as did the sermons of George Moxon, that the whole settlement was expected to attend every Sunday inside the minister's large house. Four years passed quickly, and soon Mary had four of the Smith's children under her watchful eye. The town had continued to expand and boasted new arrivals almost weekly, many of whom were scouted and invited with generous terms by William Pynchon himself in order to fill a gap in the hamlet's economy. So when the town needed bricks for chimneys, Pynchon did his best to procure a brickmaker, which is exactly how the handsome, clay-pipe-smoking Hugh Parsons came to arrive in Springfield in the summer of 1645. Hugh Parsons had been born in England, though little is actually recorded of his early life, along with his exact place of birth. Somehow, he had wound up making bricks in one of the settlements around Boston before he had been headhunted by Pynchon to make bricks for the houses in Springfield. Before Hugh's arrival, bricks had been a scarce commodity, far too costly and rare to import to the far reaches, and so it had become glaringly obvious that a brickmaker was needed. Pynchon had offered Parsons a four-acre plot for a house, plus a further seven acres of planting land in an area that the locals had named the Long Meadow in the southernmost expansion of the settlement, along with a small sum of credit for Parsons to spend at the general store the records of which were meticulously kept by Pynchon's bookkeeping. It wasn't long after his arrival that Parsons caught Mary's eye. Mary had remained single since her husband's unexplained departure way back in England, but now she had started a new life in Springfield, half the world away from her life in Wales, and she longed for a family of her own. With Mary's new life settling down in Springfield and her future seemingly tied in for the long term, she decided to seek permission from William Pynchon to remarry. Despite the fact that her husband, back in England, had reportedly been abusive before disappearing and leaving Mary on her own, out of the blue, she was technically still married in the eyes of God, and remarrying was a big deal, since it was essentially adultery, a crime that fell in direct opposition to the teachings of the Bible, and in New England, it was an offence punishable by hanging. Pynchon listened to her story and, finding a level of sympathy for her situation, he agreed to take the case to Boston, where an investigation could be carried out and a decision made by the government there as to if she should still be considered legally married. For Mary, the ordeal was quite an undertaking, having to travel to Boston herself to give testimony on her ex-husband, but it was an important process because the decision would be huge. Not only would marriage free her from the dangers of being seen as an ageing spinster, a label that would forever dictate her social status within Springfield and could even lead to ostracisation, but also because Mary had another reason to seek remarriage. Hugh Parsons had not been in Springfield long before the pair had noticed one another, and soon after his arrival, they had begun seeing each other in secret. When Mary originally visited Pynchon to ask for permission to remarry, she had decided to keep this relationship to herself. But after the investigation began to drag, she went back to see him once more and this time admitted the truth, or at least a form of the truth, in the hopes that he might be able to speed the process up. It was more than likely that at this point Mary was admitting not just to a relationship but also a pregnancy and though Pynchon kept this new detail to himself, he stepped up the pressure on Boston who four months later finally ruled Mary officially divorced and permitted her to remarry. Hugh and Mary married in November, within weeks of the decision, and quickly they began constructing their new life together. They moved into a house on the extreme southern edge of the settlement, a developing area away from the more well-to-do members 
who all lived on the northern side of town. Down there, they were surrounded by several other Welsh neighbours, which Mary no doubt found comforting. They pitched up in a two-storey wooden framed house that included a small vegetable garden, an orchard, and Hugh set up his brickworks in the garden, where he instantly found a comfortable level of prosperity, given the high demand for chimneys and Hugh's monopoly on the bricks. Setting up their home had put the fledgling family in a good deal of debt with Pynchon, who had pencilled in all the money required for the house, furnishing and tools to his ledger, a sum which he would write off as Hugh carried out his work for the town. Before long, the Parsons estate had been extended to over 37 acres, including land in the southerly planting area known as Long Meadow, as Hugh's bricks gained a solid reputation. Things weren't all roses in Springfield, however, and the same trials were always there, stalking away in the background and grinding on the lives of those that lived in the settlement. The weather remained challenging, and that winter the snow fell heavy on the ground. When the summer finally arrived in 1646, it brought with it a caterpillar infestation that destroyed much of the town's crops, a surefire sign that everyone in the settlement were not quite meeting the approval of their ever-watchful god. At the same time, tensions grew with the natives, who were often blamed for break-ins on the settlement's warehouse. Despite all the hardships, the town did continue to grow, and with it, so too did the prosperity of its citizens. With prosperity, however, came competition, suspicion and resentment, much of which had always existed below the surface as settlers brought nonsensical geographical rivalries with them from the old world and had barely managed to bury them during the most difficult years. It was in this strange transitional period for the settlement that Hannah Parsons was born on the 7th of August, just in time for a flu and smallpox outbreak to batter the population. Hugh and Mary's baby did manage to survive, but many more families were less fortunate. This had been more proof, decried Moxon during his sermons, that they must constantly strive to live by God's standards and not let the devil into their lives. It was a powerful message for the heavily religious population, but it carried even more weight that summer, after the news had spread to Springfield of a recent hanging downriver in a settlement known as Windsor. Alice Young, a 32-year-old mother of one, had been accused of witchcraft and promptly executed for her crimes, though what they were exactly, no one was entirely sure, as they were never properly recorded. Still, the rumours spread quickly, as did the rumblings that even more witches had been tried back in England after the Witchcraft Act had been reformed to include anyone who was judged to have made a pact with the devil. As stories leaked over across the sea, they spread fear like a plague across the New World settlements, and that same summer, as families were struck down by disease, rumours of a high-profile group of witches in New Haven on the southern coast of Connecticut snaked its way north. That summer, New Haven had been quite a colony of crime. Topping the weird list was a man named Thomas Hogg, who had been imprisoned for exposing his genitals, masturbating in public and having sex with a cow. Proof of the bestiality charge was thought complete when the cow went on to birth a calf that everyone agreed resembled Hogg. The story that travelled through the colonies most quickly, however, was that of the governor's wife, Anne Yale Eaton. Anne had been arrested and charged with conduct unbecoming a person of her importance and community standing, though the real list of misdemeanours was long and included marital discord, mistreatment of servants, slander, bodily violence and accusations of witchcraft against her slaves and her own daughter, Mary. Anne, it turns out, had been fostering some pretty unorthodox religious opinions that rubbed up against the religious doctrine of the colony and had, as a consequence, been excommunicated from the church. Banishment had been considered too harsh at the time and, probably given her social position, she was allowed to continue living within the boundaries of New Haven, but her ungodly ways were thought to have been a bad influence on the rest of the town. The rumours that spiralled up through the colonies that summer was of how she had told anyone in Earshaw that her daughter Mary was in league with the devil and that one of her slaves had bewitched the town's beer. The stories, together with the rumours of what had been going on with witch trials back in England, cast a dark shadow over the Connecticut Valley and all those that lived within it. Back in Springfield, Hugh and Mary Parsons were beginning to show the signs of a deep struggle. Primarily, their married life was far from bliss, 
a problem that had far wider reaching effects than just marital difficulties at home. In the 17th century colonies, marital problems reflected poorly on both husband and wife, who were considered as failing in their promises to God. For a husband who could not keep on top of his wife, he was seen as failing in his contract as a patriarch, and for the wife, she would undoubtedly be seen as failing in her womanly duties. Both outcomes could lead to social ostracisation at best, and excommunication or banishment at worst, just like Anne Eaton of New Haven had proven. Mary, who was now pregnant for a second time, was clearly struggling on her own, and appeared to be suffering from anxiety and depression. With some resentment for spending the money he'd worked so hard for, Hugh had purchased Mary several courses of the vaguely named herbal pills that were available from the general store, as well as preparing a course for a drink that was concocted of hot milk, sugar and saffron, in the hopes that she would show signs of rebalancing her humours. When everything failed to work, Hugh then went on to buy her laxatives in order to purge her of all the toxins that could be influencing her body. The problems for the Parsons weren't just at home either. Hugh had always been a solitary man. His mannerisms were often seen as unusual and his social skills seemingly left something to be desired. He would rock up to neighbours' houses with his pipe, stand around in their lounge uninvited, smoking and mumbling to himself before strolling off again, leaving everyone present to wonder quite what he was doing. He measured himself constantly against others and he resented anyone that seemed to be prospering at a higher or faster rate than himself. Ever the keen social climber, he had been working hard to improve his lot in life, a fact that had shown itself in the pricing that he had placed on his bricks. On top of his brick making, he had taken on the duty of farmer and riverman and as such, he spent almost all of his hours out of the house, a fact that only added to the resentment when he returned home to his wife who he was beginning to see as lazy, especially after she had turned down his request to go and return to maid work with the Smiths. All of this led to arguments in the Parsons' home, and they were arguments that were loud enough for the neighbours to hear as their voices broke through the flimsy wooden walls. The neighbours listened on, and slowly they began to turn their backs on the troubled couple. Of 1648, a new story of witchcraft reached Springfield. Margaret Jones of Charlestown, a colony on the eastern coast, just south of Salem, had been a midwife accused of witchcraft along with her husband, Thomas. Margaret was accused of being able to bring people to pain and vomiting just by touching them, and of bewitching people, preventing them from being healed by conventional medicine. It was also levied against her that she could see things of which she should have not had any knowledge, and of having a childlike imp that had been witnessed on several occasions. Witches were, by this point, well known to have communed with imps and familiars who worked on behalf of the devil, and so one undeniable way of catching a witch red-handed would be to subject them to the process of watching, a practice that had been used extensively in England and had now seemingly bled across the ocean. Margaret had been strapped down and watched by an overseer for a period of 24 hours, with the idea that eventually the devilish familiar would show itself and the accusation of witchcraft would be proved, which is, as far as Winthrop's journal can be believed, exactly what happened to Margaret Jones, whose familiar showed up right on cue, landing her in the hangman's noose. Her husband Thomas managed to avoid execution and fled town shortly after his release from prison. In the hours that followed her hanging, a great tempest was said to have struck the area, pulling up trees in retribution. Whilst this story of Margaret Jones spread through Springfield, Mary Parsons gave birth to their second child, Samuel Parsons, on the 8th of June, 1648. Once more, both Samuel and Mary survived childbirth, somewhat beating the odds. That summer also saw the Parsons taking a family of lodgers who crammed themselves into their home in order for Hugh to charge them a solid fee in rent. The Dorchester family included Anthony and Miller, along with his wife and three children, who all managed to find somewhere around the fireplace to sleep. It was a tense living situation at the best of times, never mind the fact that Mary had just had a baby, and also the fact that Anthony and Hugh did not get on well at all, with Anthony considering Hugh badly tempered and disrespectful of Mary. Anthony's wife was also gravely ill, suffering from consumption, which made matters considerably worse. After Mary had refused to return to her domestic work at the Smith's household, Hugh took it upon himself 
to apply to the family for any farm work, hoping that his association with Mary would give him a favourable advantage. He was sorely disappointed, however, when the Smiths promptly turned him away, which Hugh took as a personal slight. Shortly after, illness broke out in the Smith household, and the Smith's children, two-year-old Margaret and one-year-old Sarah, fell sick with fits, fevers and convulsions. In ordinary times, it would probably have been chalked up to the common diseases that were prevalent throughout colonial life, but these were not normal times. A month later, a fly infestation hit the area, and in August, the crops were destroyed by a huge flock of pigeons. Suspicion began creeping into daily life around Springfield, and the stories of witchcraft, which had seemed so far away, suddenly felt much closer, as the isolation of the rural settlement grew oppressive rather than liberating. All throughout the town, people began watching one another for signs of the devil at work, and before long, there were whispers that Hugh had had something to do with the six Smith children in revenge for being turned away for farm work. Shortly after this, Hugh had an argument with one of his pregnant neighbours, and when he left, she saw out the window down by the tree line a cluster of willow wisps, which she immediately attributed to Hugh. Fortunately for everyone, the neighbour survived her childbirth, giving birth to a healthy child, so for a short time, Hugh was off the hook. The bigger problem for the Parsons, however, was much closer to home. In secret, Mary Parsons herself had also been fostering disturbing thoughts about witchcraft, and they were about to reach a boiling point. Already anxious, Mary had heard the stories of witchcraft filtering in from around the Connecticut Valley and allowed her imagination to run wild. She became obsessed with one of the neighbours named Mary Marshfield, who had recently arrived in Springfield and of whom she believed had brought the devil with her. Mary began openly gossiping around town, accusing Marshfield of witchcraft, as she came to have seen lights in the fields around her home. Ironically, Marshfield had taught Mary how to identify a witch during a discussion that the pair had had on witchcraft, but Mary's takeaway from the encounter had been that it must surely take a witch to know a witch perhaps as a testament to how far the Parsons had fallen in the social hierarchy around Springfield, her whispered inferences amongst the neighbours not only fell on deaf ears, but seemed to turn others against Mary herself, reflecting the accusation back onto her and questioning why she was so interested in witchcraft all of a sudden. Mary wasn't alone in her suspicions though, and even Moxon had begun preaching about hellfire and demonic influences in the weekly church meetings. Their sins, he would continue to remind them, would only work to invite the devil into their lives. The atmosphere got on top of Mary, and her paranoia reached new levels. Everyone had the potential to be a witch, and needed careful watching, even her husband. In fact, for some time, Mary had been fostering suspicions against Hugh. At night, he writhed in pain, complaining about stomach cramps, and she often heard him mumbling in his sleep as he appeared tormented by his dreams. These thoughts were not helped by further rumours that the town barber, William Branch, had had a dream where he had awoken by a burst of light that filled the room whilst his family slept. Waking alone, he opened his eyes to see the bright red face of a child, whose skin was the scarlet of flames, stalk across the room and close in on him whilst he lay glued to the bed. The child touched his face, whispered, It is done, and then vanished, sending a jolt of pain down his spine that woke him in a cold sweat. Mary had had enough, convinced that Mary Marshfield had brought the devil to the settlement, haunting the resident's dreams and had possibly even consumed her own husband, she went to Pynchon to make an official accusation. It was a serious claim, and one that William Pynchon didn't take lightly. Marshfield, who also didn't take it very lightly, was angered by the claims and launched a counterclaim, charging Mary Parsons with slander. Pynchon, who was not initially too zealous about the witchcraft accusation, set a defamation trial for the end of the month, which would seal the fate of both parties. If the defamation claim was found to be false, Mary Marshfield would, by default, be recognised as a witch. If it was deemed as true, then Mary Parsons would bring a great deal of financial pain upon her household. In the weeks leading up to the trial, things really began falling apart for the Parsons family. Hugh had visited a neighbour's house belonging to Alexander and Sarah Edwards, who had owed him money for bricks. He had asked Sarah to pay him his debt in milk, but she had turned him away, explaining that the cow had not given enough to cover the debt. The following day, when she then went on to milk the cow, 
She claimed that her milk was an off colour, which she believed to have been down to Hugh bewitching the animal after she had refused him milk the night before. She took the accusation straight to Pynchon, who again showed some signs of wariness, not wanting to leap into anything. But when the cow appeared to remain healthy and no obvious cause for its strange milk could be found, he began considering alternative ideas. Mary secretly agreed and she also began talking, whispering to the neighbours that she believed Hugh had been meddling in witchcraft. Many of the neighbours were more amenable to this accusation than the one made against Mary Marshfield. After all, Hugh had always been a loner. He had stopped attending church meetings regularly and he had always seemed to be trying to get ahead of his neighbours, charging them what he liked for his bricks. She told them of his stomach pains and his poor sleep and claimed that Satan was tormenting his bowels, pricking him with pins and daggers. If nothing else, it was an indictment to how poor their marriage had become, but also for the state of Mary's mental instability. The following day, May 29th, Mary's defamation trial began. Pynchon was the judge and jury, and the whole settlement poured into the meeting house to watch on as the testimonies were given. Mary Marshfield opened up the proceedings by giving her side of the story, assuring everyone that she was not a witch and simply a victim of spite. Mary Parsons replied the next day, attempting to lay out her case that Marshfield was a witch, but with no witnesses willing to come forward and back up the accusation, her case appeared weak in the extreme, shining a bright spotlight and exposing how socially isolated the Parsons had become within Springfield. Pynchon declared Mary Parsons as guilty of defamation and sentenced her to receive 20 lashes, pardoning Mary Marshfield at the same time. If Mary wanted to avoid the public whipping, however, she was given the opportunity to pay a £3 fine payable to Mary Marshfield in cash or bushels of corn. Mary chose to pay the fine, much to Hugh's great irritation. The whole affair not only cost him a considerable sum, but also further isolated him from the rest of the town, who looked upon him as a failed husband who was completely unable to care for his wife and keep her in check, two facets that were considered of grave importance to 17th century Puritans. As if he needed any more excuses, he now shrank away from his social obligations entirely, shunning the Sunday church meetings in favour of spending time working alone, and he often took to sleeping out in the long meadow far away from town. By the summer of 1649, Hugh wasn't the only one struggling, however, and church attendances fell right across the town as people struggled to keep up with their work. Bug infestations had returned with a vengeance that year, and most were caught in a catch-22 situation of attending church and having Moxon preach to them about God's punishment whilst their harvest suffered, or foregoing church to attend their harvests, for which they felt their spirituality suffer, as they saw firsthand the work of an angry God. A dark atmosphere fell heavy across the settlers, and many continued to suspect witchcraft to be in play. William Branch, the barber who had had the vision of the red-faced boy, had ever since been struggling with, with what it had all meant, though he was pretty sure whatever it was had something to do with the Parsons. One day, as he was walking by their house, he felt his legs taken with an uncanny stiffness, which lasted for two days, making it difficult for him to walk at all, and when he did, he felt the soles of his feet burn like they were walking across coals heated from the fires of hell. It was, to him, undoubtedly a matter of witchcraft. Smallpox returned to the settlement in a new wave, and Mary spotted a black dog in the shadows of the tree line as she stared hazily out the window one night while she listened to her lodger, Sarah Dorchester, struggle for breath, slowly dying of consumption. It was a horrible situation, and Mary was not dealing with it very well at all. She began hearing voices and sounds that she attributed to demons and witchcraft and blamed everything on Hugh. The one large change since the defamation trial was that Mary now no longer whispered about her suspicions of her husband and instead spoke to anyone who might listen. Hugh naturally caught wind of this, but when Mary became aware that he knew what she had been saying, she became convinced that he had been spying on her thoughts via supernatural means. It spawned a destructive cycle as Mary's suspicions of Hugh grew ever larger and Hugh, in turn, began to suspect Mary of being bewitched. Hugh eventually requested he check Mary for any marks on her body that might link her to witchcraft or a demonic familiar, but she denied him, only leading to his suspicions growing. Likewise, Mary, harbouring her own suspicions, 
waited for Hugh to fall asleep before checking over his body, and though she found nothing incriminating, her insistence that he was a witch remained as strong as ever. Things turned from bad to worse when Samuel Parsons grew sick at the end of September. Hugh rushed out into the street one night after waking to find him struggling to breathe and called out for help. None of the neighbours answered the call, but the next day they all discussed how they believed his illness to be the work of witchcraft. When the young child inevitably died on the 1st of October, everyone watched on with deep suspicion, thinking Hugh heartless after he bottled up his emotions, concerned with the damage of his image if he cried in public. Merry voice aloud all of the neighbours' whispered thoughts, that it was Hugh who had killed Samuel, bewitching the child to death. A week later, things went from bad to worse when Sarah Dorchester finally expired as she lost her long battle with consumption. It was without a doubt the darkest time in Springfield for the Parsons, and for many others too. The fear of witchcraft had spread from England, west through the colonies, and infested the settlement with an anxiety that gnawed on the edges of the social fabric, slowly chewing away and destroying the bonds that had once been so integral to the success of the community. Moxon, the town's minister, grew tired, and he began to hear his own thoughts on returning to England, a terrifying idea to Pynchon, who offered the clergyman a pay rise, from what was already a respectable £55 a year to £70. It was a sign of how deep the rod set, when even the most well-to-do considered leaving. But even Pynchon himself was growing weary of colonial life, especially as he found his religious views to so often be in contention with the governors back in Boston. In an act of defiance, he took it upon himself to publish a book named The Meritous Price of Our Redemption, which was seen as nothing less than heresy. As the book was burned in public by the hangman back in Boston, the unease of a shaking leadership spread back to Springfield, adding to the fears and anxieties that hung heavy in the air. By 1650, the townsfolk were actively avoiding Hugh Parsons, who struggled to find anyone to help him with his work, leading him to recede further into himself. When anyone did spend any amount of time with him, they were careful not to draw his ire terrified of the consequences which they were reminded of daily when Mary continued to spread rumours of his links to the devil. Amazingly, despite everything, Mary managed to wind up pregnant for a third time and in October she gave birth to another boy, which they named Joshua. Following Sarah's death, the Dorchesters had moved out of the Parsons' house, which freed up a lot of room, but the pressure was hardly relieved and the new baby caused a huge strain on a relationship that was already completely dysfunctional. Hugh and Mary would argue daily, much to their neighbour's great aggravation. Hugh was struggling to quash his frustrations, and when he snapped at Moxon, withdrawing a contract to build him a chimney, the whole town reeled in shock as the minister's children fell sick the very next day. As they shivered from fevers through the night and suffered violent convulsions, fear spread through the settlement that if Hugh could bewitch the Moxon children, he could attack anyone. By spring of 1651, the whole town was finally on board with Mary, who now found her accusations of Hugh being enthusiastically received. Convinced that Hugh had been spying on her with his supernatural powers, she threw caution to the wind, deciding secrecy was futile, and began speaking openly, accusing her husband of bewitchery at every turn, sure that the whole town was in the grip of his torturous work. In the middle of the alehouse, she gave a dramatic performance, falling into a trance and telling the neighbours of how Satan had spoken to her and told her that he had possessed Hugh, showing her visions of Hugh shapeshifting into various animals as he danced around a fireplace with two other locals, Sarah Merrick and Beth Sewell, who she said were also witches. Shortly after, she visited George and Hannah Langton, neighbours from just north along the river, and together they performed a counterspell by tossing a bag pudding, a mixture of offal oats and maize, onto an open fire, a ritual that was said to draw out and summon any witches that were in the nearby vicinity. If Hugh's silence until now had done nothing but convince others of his guilt, his showing up at the door shortly after the ashes of the pudding fell through the grate was nothing short of proof positive. The Langtons went to Pynchon the very next day, who heard their pudding story, and inked it into his stack of notes on the Parsons, which was now turning into quite the document. Pressure was mounting on Pynchon to do something about what was now common knowledge throughout the whole settlement, so with a flourish of his pen, he issued a warrant for the arrest of Mary Parsons. 
the constable, Thomas Merrick, who just happened to be the husband of one of the accused witches in Mary's vision, picked her up at home and took her into custody, stashing her in Pynchon's own house, tying her up next to the fireplace. Failing to realise that it was her constant obsession and suspicion that had got her into the situation in the first place, her defence hinged on fingering Hugh for everything that she could think of, blaming him for bewitching the Smith children until they had died, as well as for murdering their son Samuel with witchcraft in order to free Mary's time up so that she could help him with the farm work. She said that he was an ambitious man, jealous of his neighbours and keen to prosper in any way that he could. When Hugh found out that she had been arrested, he confided with one of his neighbours that he had suspected her of witchcraft for some time. Over the following days, Pynchon took statements from all the neighbours surrounding the Parsons' home and scribbled them all down. Years of slights, insults and petty issues were now coming home to roost. Clear that Hugh was as much a problem as Mary, an arrest warrant was issued for him too, and Merrick did the duties for a second time, this time chaining him in his own home. Following Hugh's arrest, several people complained of seeing a black dog stalking through the settlement, disappearing into the shadows. Pynchon's investigation into Hugh's case followed much the same trajectory as Mary's, as the town all turned on him, blaming every little thing upon his secret supernatural powers. Hugh now found the true cost of his somewhat unsociable demeanour, as every squabble, suspicion and defective brick was noted shining a spotlight on his isolation. For his part, he denied being a witch and he denied suspecting Mary of witchcraft as well. Pynchon, however, had heard the story of the burnt pudding and he had found it most compelling. Rather conveniently, the fact that the ritual was a noted form of pagan magic itself was ignored and only the result was considered important. When Pynchon had asked Hugh why he had not shown any grief for the death of his son, he had explained that he had kept his sorrows private choosing not to display his pain publicly. Despite this, his behaviour upon hearing the death of his son remained one of the main charges against him. At the end of a difficult weekend, both Mary and Hugh were inspected for signs of devil's marks, though presumably none were ever found. Mary, at least, was sent home to live in a strange form of pseudo-house arrest, which would sadly turn out to be a fateful decision. The following day, the parson's new baby, Joshua, passed away. No record of the cause of death was ever given, but everyone in the town was convinced that it had been Mary. Following Joshua's death, both Hugh and Mary were kept under close watch in order to catch sight of any impish familiar that would inevitably show its face. Whilst her watcher sat with her, Mary confessed that she had been visited by Satan and had accepted her fate in becoming a witch, even explaining in detail of how she had shapeshifted into a cat. She testified against Hugh, saying that she knew he was a witch because he understood her when she had spoken out about witches in the past. When he came home from work in the evenings, she would hear otherworldly noises following his wake, and she blamed all of the misfortunes of people in the town upon his bewitchery. She also relayed the story of the black dog that she had seen, convinced that it was a vision of Hugh's magic. The confession, at least, would have come to some relief to Pynchon, who recognised that the development would greatly simplify his role in the affair, though he wished Hugh might do the same. Quite the opposite of Mary, the brickmaker was keeping perfectly quiet, aside from complaining to Merrick about his stomach pains at night, which, whilst it came with some suspicions, was far from a confession. When Pynchon had finished collecting all the testimonies from the townsfolk, he stitched the document together and sent it off to Boston, as the charges were far too serious for him to try them in Springfield himself. When they were later summoned, Hugh and Mary, along with a handful of key witnesses from Springfield, made the 100-mile trek east together in a journey that must have been uncomfortable on just about every level. More concerning for Springfield as a whole was the fact that Pynchon was also summoned. The government in Boston had finished the investigation into Pynchon's heretical book and now they expected a full official retraction from the outspoken magistrate. With everyone away, the deep anxiety that saturated Springfield loomed heavy, and strange happenings previously blamed on the pair of witches continued unabated. By sheer coincidence, a second Mary Parsons, completely unrelated, was locked in her cellar after she began having fits and screaming about witches surrounding her, while Sarah Miller also began having fits and convulsions as she saw apparitions of a dark figure that she could just barely make out as resembling Hugh. 
every death in the town from disease, was still chalked up to Hugh or Mary, despite the fact that they were over a hundred miles away. The level of tension is a good example of why so many witnesses were happy to trek all the way back across the colonies to Boston to see the witches hanged, in a conclusion that they hoped would put an end to Springfield's suffering once and for all. Mary's trial in Boston opened on Thursday the 8th of May in the Boston General Court. Since she had already confessed to being a witch, it was expected to be a straightforward affair in front of a panel of three judges and 12 jurors, along with a large crowd who were there just to see the face of the witch. They were to be sorely disappointed, however, when the trial had to be suspended due to Mary falling ill from typhus, caught in the overcrowded Boston prison cells that they had been kept in after their arrival, and she now claimed herself far too sick to appear. The court was adjourned until the following day, and after a second no-show, it was delayed for a further four days. Meanwhile, Pynchon went up in front of the governors himself, charged with heresy. He was given a straightforward ultimatum, to retract his book and continue to live, or stand up for his religious views and accept banishment or even death. It didn't take Pynchon long to agree to a retraction with a full apology, though in truth it was somewhat hollow in its delivery. Pynchon had long been fostering thoughts of returning to England, and when he stepped out of the governor's office, he made a promise to return at a later date to officiate the retraction. He knew full well it would be a promise he would break, and that by then he would be long gone, with the colonies far behind him. The following Tuesday, Mary's trial resumed, and though Mary was still sick, she was dragged out to the bench, the judges being bent on having the trial start no matter what. Standing in front of the packed room, she was charged with two indictments the first being that of witchcraft and the second of murdering her son. Much to just about everyone's surprise, Mary pleaded not guilty to the charge of being a witch. It was a bold move given that she had previously confessed the opposite. A procession of seven witnesses from Springfield gave testimony to her guilt, with another 23 being read by William Pynchon from his collected documents. One of the principal witnesses was a man named Jonathan Taylor who gave an account of a dream where he had seen a vision of three black and yellow snakes crawl across the floor of his house to his bed where one had stretched out and bit him on the forehead and at the same time he had heard a voice whisper the word death into his ear. The trial was made difficult for the prosecution for a number of reasons. First and foremost was that a felony had to be witnessed by at least two people and the vast majority of the testimonies were little more than personal tales. After careful consideration, the jury returned their verdict to the court, concluding that they had insufficient evidence to convict Mary of witchcraft. The Springfield contingent looked on in exasperation, as the woman they knew to be a witch was seemingly escaping her deserved fate. The court then moved on to the second charge of murdering her son, and in the spirit of shock and surprise that had become a factor of the trial so far, Mary pleaded guilty. A sigh of relief swept through the room as Mary was sentenced to be hanged two weeks later on May the 29th. Mary's typhus, however, had other ideas and the excited public were denied their public execution when Mary died in prison before her execution date. For now, their hopes rested on the trial of Hugh Parsons. Whilst Hugh waited in the Boston jail, Pynchon returned to Springfield with the witnesses for Mary's trial and stepped down as magistrate, handing over the reins to his son-in-law, Henry Smith, and finalising his plans to sail back to England. This also meant that it fell to Henry Smith to return to Boston in June in order to attend Hugh's trial, a journey which he took with considerably fewer witnesses by his side than had been with his father a few months before. Hugh's trial got underway on the 17th of June 1651, and like Mary, saw Hugh plead not guilty to the single charge of witchcraft. Henry Smith had far fewer sources to draw from in Hugh's trial, and once again, those that did testify against Hugh were more often than not a lone, single witness. As before, the jury returned a verdict of insufficient evidence, effectively pardoning Hugh from his imprisonment, but the Boston governors had other ideas. The case was sent to the Court of Assistance in the hopes that a guilty verdict could be found. At the same time, Smith was ordered to return to Springfield and relay to Pynchon that he must return and finalise his retraction or pay a fine of £100. It was the last Pynchon ever heard from the governors of Boston as he sailed to England in the spring of 1652, leaving his heretical accusations far behind him. 
Hugh's trial was restarted on the 12th of May, after he had spent almost a year in prison already. This time, the jury made a unanimous decision that Hugh Parsons had been guilty of witchcraft. However, the general court objected on the grounds that the principal witness for the prosecution was Mary Parsons, who was long since dead. With no other options left to them, the governors of Boston released Hugh on the 1st of June, 1652. Following the trial, Hugh Parsons stayed in Boston with his daughter, Hannah. His estate in Springfield had long since been carved up and liquidated by his neighbours, and he was sent a grand total of six bushels of wheat from Henry Smith, who then considered the books squared. Hugh went on to remarry and live a respectable life, free from accusations of witchery, in Rhode Island until his death in 1685. The settlement of Springfield faced a somewhat rockier future, after it was pillaged and levelled by natives in 1675. It was rebuilt and continued to thrive and was awarded city status in 1852. 39 years later, it became the birthplace of basketball, invented by a grad student who was keen to keep warm indoors during the harsh winters. In 2020, the census recorded a population of over 150,000, awarding it the status of third biggest city in Massachusetts. Following the trials of Hugh and Mary Parsons, the paranoia and anxiety surrounding witchcraft in Springfield and the wider colonies only continued to escalate, culminating in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 that saw over 200 accusations of witchcraft and 19 executions, over doubling the number of successful witchcraft trials leading to execution in the colonies for the whole of the 17th century. The fear of witches had slowly spread from Europe like a creeping plague bringing anxiety, division and fear to the communities right across the New World, preying on the populations of isolated settlements like a black dog in the shadows and turning them against themselves. So that was the story of Hugh and Mary Parsons, who were one of the first witches ever to be tried in the entire New World. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that because it's quite an interesting... Well, there's a lot to talk about after this short advert breaks. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we just don't know what we want or why we react the way that we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. I've personally been using BetterHelp and I've found it a positive experience. I'm still using it now. Um, and I've had therapy uh, several times throughout my life, mostly to deal with things like uh, social anxiety uh, and generalised anxiety. And I think, uh, yeah, it, I've, I've always found it a positive experience, no matter what the type of therapy has been. Um you know, sometimes I've had therapy for reasons I feel were quite, quite, quite large, where I was having like anxiety that was affecting my my life quite drastically. And other times, like at the moment where I'm doing uh, therapy with better help, I don't necessarily have, I would say, like a strong reason to be there. It's it's more, I'm more just talking through some of the social anxieties that are, that I have, and I'm finding it, you know, a remarkably useful uh, service. Uh, and like it says, really, like explore some of my boundaries and, and just get a bit more understanding about myself. So, yeah, personally, for me, the thing uh, that I find great about BetterHelp since using it is just the fact that it's entirely online and that I can do it in my own time. Uh, it, everything is, <laughs> I mean, everything's basically at my convenience with with my therapist. And and just, the, the, I guess, the flexibility of it is, is for me, the, the key to this, um, especially... For someone like myself who, to, to be honest, I don't have so much time to to nip out to a therapy session, if you like. So just to be able to sort of sit there and just stick it on my laptop and, and just nail out a therapy session for an hour on a Monday morning has been really good for me. So yes, if you are thinking of starting therapy, try giving better help a try. It's completely online, like I mentioned. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suit to your schedule, uh, which, as I say, it completely is. Uh, you fill out a questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist who you can switch at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash darkhistories today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, 
patreon.com slash dark histories. Cheers. Welcome back. Yeah, so quite a lot to sort of talk about there. Although it's difficult because a lot of it is essentially speculation. But we can make some sort of educated uh, guesses about what was going on, you know, when you look at like, just the social aspects and the politics of it all. And, and I think there what I found really interesting about this case was the social and the political aspects, whereby, you know, uh, the, the, the whole town had an awful lot of anxiety um, based around the kind of shaky leadership of William Pynchon, who I say shaky leadership, you know, it seemed to me like he was actually quite a good leader and he seemed at times to be quite um, measured. For, for the period, even, um, I think you would go as far as saying. But later in his tenancy of, of magistrate of um, Springfield, when he was sort of you know planning to go back to England and writing that book, which, you know, was considered heretical by the Boston government. I thought that was really interesting how, you know, that that, that uncertainty basically sort of spawned a great deal of anxiety amongst people, which kind of went into the anxiety melting pot that they had going on of, you know, the, the, the stories of witchcraft that had sort of slowly crept over from England, which I, was, I thought, a really a, another really interesting aspect. And of course, on top of that, then you have the sort of the social elements, um, you know, the fact that uh, Hugh and Mary were, their relationship was essentially a complete failure, um, which is a hard one to really speak about. And this is where we sort of get into speculation, I think, because, I mean, their, their relationships seem just pretty awful, but like Hugh Parsons seemed quite um, like a, obviously sort of a, a bit of a loner and and sounds to me relatively socially awkward in that, uh, you know, there were times he would just sort of like show up in people's houses and just like like uninvited. And, and he was, I don't know, it seemed like he was quite socially awkward to me for, for a lot of things. Um, and, and it seemed as well that by and large, he just wanted to get on with life. Um, you know, there there were things that were kind of went against him. Like he was, his, his sort of ambition at times sort of seemed to turn towards greed, which obviously, you know, he had a monopoly on the bricks and he was charging a lot of money for his work on on the chimneys that everyone needed. And so obviously this was straight away, it turned everyone against him because you had this like element of competition where it wasn't there prior you know, when the, when the settlement was in its earliest days, they had all these really difficult things to contend with, like the weather and the disease and all the rest of it. But they didn't really have the competition amongst themselves. And then once it started prospering, suddenly you had that extra element mixed in and, and all of the troubles between everyone that had been bubbling under the surface just started to break out. And I think that's what you really get with this. Is Hugh was sort of for a long time, bubbling under everyone's surface because he did a lot of things to rub people up the wrong way. Say, so especially his social, his social heavy handedness uh, seems to have got under sort of people's skin quite, quite easily. And then you mix in that they had that say they had the, the, the poor uh, relationship with Mary. And, and that was itself a, you know, a huge deal. You know, it was a really big sign that things, huge things that was going wrong spiritually with um, Mary and Hugh, not just, you know, in, in they, not just the fact that they were having a, a difficult marriage. Um, so that was all really interesting. And then, and then we get to Mary, and, and Mary is a fascinating case, but one that I think you have to be very careful of because it's really easy um, to just sort of turn around and say that she was obviously suffering from like issues with mental health. Uh, and now we know that. To a certain degree, because we know that um, there are records that, of, of Hugh purchasing medicine from the general store. And, and we also know that, you know, he, he uh, purchased their medicine um, to basically like um, try and purge her of toxins and, you know, reset her humours and all this stuff. So we know that she clearly was suffering from some poor mental health there. But it, it's really tempting to say with every, everything that she was experiencing that she was like, you know, maybe like uh, sort of paranoid schizophrenia and all things like this. But but of course we don't know. But it is interesting that she did appear to be having uh, sort of some sort of auditory hallucinations uh, and possibly visual as well. 
uh, you know, but how much of it was just plain hysteria also, which, you know, you have to mix in um, because clearly there was an element of hysteria in the whole village. So, you know, how much of uh, what was wrong with Mary was down to her mental health and how much of it was just plain hysteria? Um, and it's really hard to say. And I, th I find it, you know, I, I always say in dark issues that I don't like sort of armchair diagnosing people. And, and it, it, I repeat that here, I guess, like, I'm I'm fascinated by what was wrong with Mary, but at the same time, I'm I'm cautious of going too far there and start sort of making claims that I just can't simply back up, and we just can't back up because there was just we just don't have the evidence. You know, we have such a slim amount of evidence to go on. We can only really sort of guess. Uh, but it's but obviously there was there was something there that was that was difficult. And I uh, and, and and I mean I I think that Mary lived a really difficult life. She was basically trying to raise the children. She was expected to do farm work on top of that, and seemingly in a pretty terrible relationship with her husband. Uh, you know, if we take away the witchcraft stuff, you know, Hugh never really. It's difficult because uh, so so physical abuse against your wife definitely would have been seen as a. Um, a massive no-no back then uh you know as, as it is now and as it, as it should be but um but physical violence back then would have been you know grounds for Hugh to be banished essentially so I, it's it's hard to say that he was probably being physically abusive but it, it's clear I think that he was being at least mentally abusive um you know he he seemed to be um piling on an awful lot of pressure on her and the neighbors mentioned that, that she, he he often they, they they said that he bullied her um, which, you know, m makes you think that it was probably, um, you know, some sort of sort of uh, mental abuse going on there somewhere. So she had all that to contend with. Um, you know, it's, it's no surprise that she kind of had some sort of breakdown, maybe. I don't know. It's really difficult. Um, it's difficult because it's obviously, of course, really interesting to make these guesses and, uh, you know, try and work out what was going on. But at the same time, you have to be quite sensitive and it's, that, that, that's quite hard because you sometimes you have to sort of stop yourself running away a little bit um but anyway um you know it was an interesting story I, I thought it was really interesting that um you know it was quite well documented for one of the earlier witch cases because obviously Salem is is well documented and that's the one that everyone knows but the cases that led up to Salem almost none of them appeared to be documented which I found really interesting because when I heard stories that I wanted to insert into this one, you know, when they were hearing stories creeping through the colonies and they, they, they um, you know, they, the rumours were spreading around Springfield about, you know, these witches being sort of uh, tried here and there. Um, you had the one from Charlestown and the one from New Haven, for example. Um, like, like, neither of them were particularly well documented. And so it was quite interesting that this one was very well documented in the complete opposite. You know, I suppose we have William Pynchon to thank for that for taking you know so many pages of meticulous notes and testimony and such but um you know uh it was it's interesting anyway i, f I found it interesting as an earlier case uh, you know you can you can sort of see it. it's simpler than the salem cases because it's earlier if you like um and i think with it being slightly like simpler it becomes therefore easier to see the the the, the influences that created the situation uh, i guess and that, that's that. That's quite interesting, um, or, or I thought it was quite interesting anyway. I hope you did as well. But anyway, that's about that for this week's episode. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you want to contact me about anything, you can do so. Contact at darkhistories.com is the email address. You can also find me on social media and just about all the platforms. Uh, I, I say that like, like I really am good at social media, but um, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Dark Issues is on there. You can find it. There's also a Discord server if you want to join that. And um, basically, um, go on the website. You'll find all the ways that you can contact me there. And you'll also find all the ways that you can support if you would like to, including buying merch, joining the patron, uh, buying books for the podcast, or donating. You know, if you want to, basically, if you want to support, then there's there's lots of ways you can do that. But again, if not, no worries. Anyway, with that all said and done, thanks very much for listening. I'll be back in just under two weeks. So until then, take care and sleep tight.